talking. So we're here at the lab in uh, Hawthorne, New Jersey, and I have a, a mobile camera that I used to uh, allow us to show us around the lab. And let me show you guys what it is we are doing over here. Uh, Jeremiah is working on some stuff on the board, but uh, this is a lab space that we recently just set up. Um, this is in addition to the Faraday cage and the control room we have out, um, out on the other side of the lab. Um, there, there's a bit of construction going on over there. We're renovating the bathroom and, and some other stuff. I'm not going to join with audio on this one. Uh, and this, this is pretty much our lab setup. Uh, we have the gyroscopes. Right now we only have one gyroscope. This is for the uh, uh, gyroscope procession uh, experiment. Uh, they're coming in from uh, the United Kingdom, from Great Britain. Uh, it should be here sometime later next week. And uh, we're also working on ALSIFON, which is the Dynamic Nuclear Orientation Experiment. Uh, we, have a, we have two systems to run this experiment. Basically, it's a laminar magnetic field, similar to what Todd was talking about. You need to create a laminar homogeneous magnetic field, and then you hit it with uh, uh, microwaves at the Larmor precessional frequency. And it's all laid out in, in the book over here, the paper written by uh, Fred Galsfan. I've gone over this a couple of times at APEC. Uh, Anti-gravity of present technology. This was actually published in 1981, and they replicated the experiment in 1994, apparently, with 80% uh, weight loss within the first second. Uh, so I thought it was a pretty promising experiment to try. It does have a very high um, benchmark to enter this experiment because you do need you need a microwave source and it needs to be coherent microwave source. So it's kind of hard to just use a, um, a regular microwave uh, generator. Uh, we're using a traveling wave tube. We also have a klystron that's capable of 3,500 watts. The traveling wave tube is only capable of 20 watts. Uh, we're having trouble with the wave guides in order to get all the energy into the uh, test sample. Um, this is pretty much laid out over here. This is the uh, wave guide. I'm sure it doesn't look like this exactly. And you have the north and south pole of the electromagnet or whatever magnet you are using. And what that's supposed to do is create a state of uh, dynamic nuclear orientation where the nucleus of the atom is actually oriented and that should detach yourself from the uh, Earth's gravitic field and possibly the inertial field. There's a couple of different uh, explanations to how this experiment would work have, you know, if it, it is successful. So there's, there's more theories than there are experiments in this, uh, in this regard. Um, we've also worked extensively with uh, Thomas Townsend Brown's work with the, the gravitator. Uh, he calls this the Byfield Brown effect. Really, it's all about Thomas Townsend Brown. Uh, he's just, this is actually the only paper where uh, Byfield is mentioned. And uh, so far, our replications have had mixed results. Uh, we had one guy in Vietnam, Nam Tran, who tried these experiments. He's always getting positive results. And then he sent over his capacitors to us to try them. And we were getting null results using our uh, DC power supply. And we since realized that the uh, power supply may be, you know, the signal input to the parallel plate capacitor may be more important than the uh, capacitor itself. Uh, and given the type of technology that he had at the time, it's possible that it wasn't a very clean DC signal. There might've been a DC bias with a more, more of an AC form on top of that or an inverted sawtooth. And that, that is something that we're looking into. We actually have the components to build that and try that experiment that, in that fashion. Um, I don't believe this is warp drive right now. Our current theory is that it's, uh, it's more of a electron rocket of some sorts and it would create a, a bit of propulsion, which when used in conjunction with the uh, dynamic nuclear orientation experiments, which will pretty much remove all the inertial mass of the craft, you can then use a small amount of thrust to uh, you know, propel the craft in whatever direction it is you wanna go. And that's, that's kind of what like Mark McCandless's ARV picture shows where you have the parallel plate capacitors in the base and uh, you know, there's, uh, there's these uh, big coils and there's an aluminum flywheel. It's kind of important to use aluminum for this because aluminum maintains its dynamic nuclear orientation better than most materials. Um, the way the dynamic nuclear orientation is created is by 
applying the homogeneous magnetic field, which as, as Todd mentioned, is pretty difficult to achieve. Uh, an EPR electromagnet is, you know, the ideal, you know, it's, that's what's already, that's, that, that's the, um, uh, the standard uh, ap approach. Uh, but those things are very big and very expensive and hard to find. Uh, we do know of one that's in South America in a dumpster that we might try to salvage, but it's been there for a couple of years, so it's probably uh, all corroded. But these 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 devices are pretty hard to find, so we had to build one ourselves. Then you have the sample in the center of the homogeneous magnetic field, and when, and having a sample in the center of a ma ma homogeneous magnetic field, what that does is it orients the um, electrons. Um, Based on the strength of the magnetic field, and they process, which is the ax the spin of the axis at the Larmor precession, which is way up in the gigahertz range, which is why we have to use microwaves. So it's really about tuning the microwaves to the strength of the magnetic field and pulsing the microwaves as well. Because every time you pulse the microwaves, it energizes the um, it energizes the electrons, and then that uh, orientation can then when you turn off the uh, microwave force can then transfer its orientation to the core and you slowly build up a orientation in the core and basically creating nuclear magnetism, which is pretty much what this effect should be called, in my opinion. Um, and once you have that, the craft should lose its uh, inertial mass and uh, detach itself from the gravi gravitic field because uh, second law of thermodynamics states that everything goes toward it. Uh, state of entropy goes from order to disorder. So in the core of an atom, we can expect there to be a lot of entropy. There's uh, all the subatomic particles are probably spinning, processing in all different directions with very intricate spins. And it's possible that that is what creates the inertial frame in the first place by, by having all these spins and these processions and processions of processions. Uh, when you move an object through space time, what you're actually doing is you're and adding en uh, inertial energy to it or kinetic energy to it, what you're actually doing is energizing the subatomic particles in the uh, core of the atom, which is where all the mass is stored. And, and then when it hits, you know, when the baseball hits the bat, all those spins all change. Um, but if you orient all of the spins and they're no longer incoherent, make a state of coherent matter, the craft will then essentially become weightless. And uh, as David Alzafon stated in his book, he, he actually wrote a couple books on this. This is the son of the uh, the inventor, um, Frederick Alzafon. So this is David Alzafon's two books that he wrote and they're published on Amazon. Um, that it, it's also possible that this can create um, an invisibility system because uh, we're, we're all interacting over here, like even on this table, we're interacting with the electron field. We're not interacting with the core of the atom. The core of the atom is what creates the inertial mass, but the, the interactions that we're having here are really with the electron fields. So if you oriented all the electron fields, it's possible that light will be able to travel straight through the hull of the craft. And uh, the, that can explain many of the phenomena that I've seen around flying saucers and such. Um, but this does not create propulsion. This is just gets rid of the inertial mass, you know, if it works. Uh, and propulsion can be created with uh, possibly with this experiment. We're also trying the uh, pod clone of impulse experiment using superconductors. And uh, uh, that is, uh, that paper is over here. This is uh, from pod clone. If you're all very familiar with this, this is actually from Tim Ventura's uh, American Anti-Gravity. And uh, they used a Marx generator, similar to what we're we have over here, and we are trying to build a Marx generator ourselves. We have a whole bunch of capacitors, and uh, Jeremiah can show you what we are doing with that so far. Yeah, so we went on eBay and got a bunch of these surplus 30 kV uh, 1000 picofarad capacitors. They're really nice and decent polypropylene capacitors, so they'll have a very low ESR because of the technology that's used, and they also have a fairly high resilience to. Uh, partial over voltages where they can still operate even if there's a problem with one of these caps. So uh, we we got a total of uh, eight of these or ten of these boards. Each contains eight capacitors. We were missing one. We went through and tested all of them. We found a total of seven bad capacitors that we're not going to be using in this system. So uh, what we ended up with is a bunch of these really nice thick pieces of printed circuit board here with some terminals 
and uh, we matched ball terminals and some metric stainless steel screws. So this is all stainless hardware with these points. And what we're gonna end up doing, let's see if I can grab another board out of there, is uh, in order to control the discharge voltage, the nice thing that uh, we got in our eBay purchase is that these two boards are mirror images of each other. So we can put them on hinges and by placing the ball electrodes between the already positioned points on these boards and the spacing, which is already 30 kV, the same as our capacitors, um, we can adjust the discharge gap and control our output voltage and our output power. So we're gonna be reconfiguring all the capacitors that came on here. And I think uh, we've decided on a 960 kilovolt system that gives us two capacitors per uh, set. So it's just banks of two caps all in series all the way up. And uh, this is what we're considering for the Pocketon uh, impulse discharge. So our, our two I cannot hear Jeremiah at all. We hear you, Jeremy, what's up? I can't hear you at all. You need a better, you need to be mic up. Can you, uh, can you hear me now? Much better. Okay, it's the lapel mic then. Oh, why don't you just grab mine? Why don't you just shut yours off and I'll turn mine on because it's already attached to me. Oh, okay, it's, it's been turned off. Okay. I'm oh, sorry about that. Uh, technical technical difficulties. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Or am I still coming through quiet? I, I, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Then okay. That's good enough. Yeah, so um, our, two, our two options for our Marx generator are we can use 64 of our capacitors. That gives us a total of 28.8 joules of discharge energy, 960 kV impulse. Now, uh, the advantage of a higher voltage in the Pakhanov impulse discharge experiment is that any distance between the superconducting emitter and the target electrode, we can get a slightly farther distance. We can get a larger quantity of electrons in that plasma stream because of that greater distance. And also we have a higher electric potential that's immediately presented from the marks onto the surface of the superconducting emitter. So. We, we are thinking about going with a higher voltage just so that we have some wiggle room in order to guarantee we get a nice even surface plasma discharge because we want that initial high voltage impulse and, and we don't want it to get stuck in just one plasma stream. We want that current to expand wide enough with enough potential behind it where we have a quantity of electrons available to cover the full surface of the superconductor and guarantee we get current flow through any flux pinned regions that are already present. Uh, the other option was that we could use 72 capacitors and get a slightly higher discharge current and a total energy of 32.4 joules, and that would limit our output voltage to 720 kV. Uh, it would make the Marx generator slightly smaller, and because it's physically smaller, the distance that electrons have to travel through the whole circuit would be consequently shorter, which would give us technically a slightly faster impulse. So even though we only have a small difference between 28.8 and 32.4 joules of discharge energy, we should have with this configuration because it's physically smaller by one quarter of the total length, we should have a consequently faster wavefront. So uh, we're still negotiating that. We think we're gonna go with the higher voltage, but uh, we would certainly appreciate input from any of you as far as um, what's gonna happen in the vacuum chamber and whether or not we need better current or you know higher voltages in order to achieve that even surface discharge plasma that Pakhanov talks about as a necessity for making the gravity impulse work. Um, the other thing we have, just to kind of go over it, we have some YBCO superconductor. Um, according to Poor and Pakhanov, they were custom-made superconductors that both scientists used. And so we're using commercial superconductors. We're not sure if they're actually going to be suitable for a proper application of Pakhanov. But we're going to go ahead and go through the motions and do everything as if we had the right superconducting material so that we can get set up for it. That way, the only thing that we have to do is mount our superconducting emitter if we need one custom centered. Um, electrically bonding the superconductor to the surface, we found out about the bilayer effect thanks to Poehr and how you have these Josephson junctions inside that superconducting material by injecting certain insulators, dielectrics, or uh, other materials into the mixture. And so uh, we have to figure out how to properly electrically bond our superconductor to our Josephson uh, junction material, whatever we choose to use. And uh, in this case, we're gonna use indium, we think. We tried with gallium live on air the other day and it was a, uh, it was a terrible disaster. The gallium did actually stick when we applied some pressure with some electrical tape on the outside, just to sort of 
pull the two pieces together, but ultimately gallium is uh, it's 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 rate of thermal contraction versus the copper that we use to bind and the superconductor. They're all far too different from each other, and it peeled away. Uh, so, that that happened right at super critical yeah. levels, like literally right It happened right about there. ten degrees just before we hit super critical. So it, it held up pretty well for most of the part, but once we got down to the real low temperatures, uh, something broke it off. So we're going to try indium instead. Indium is uh, apparently a much more common used material. It also doesn't tend to eat into metals, which is why it's used in laser diodes with gold surfaces. So it doesn't eat through the gold and cause an electrical contact issue. Uh, then we have to work on a vacuum discharge chamber. In this case, we're just using an acrylic tube. We're going to use a half inch thick wall, four inch diameter uh, cast acrylic piece, probably about two feet long so that we can see the inside of the chamber and watch our plasma discharge. We think this is really important because according to Popkinoff's papers, the shape of the surface of the plasma discharge coming off the superconducting emitter determines the consequent intensity of the gravity impulse. And so he was reporting that what happened is a almost cylindrical like form came off as a plasma from the surface of the superconducting emitter. And if we don't actually see that in our application, then we know we have not faithfully replicated based on the reported information in his paper. Uh, so that's something else that we're going to do. We think we figured out, figured out the bilayer alternative, thanks to POR. So we're going to work on that too. Uh, this is where we're at with Eugene Pogkinoff stuff. And then the other thing that we're really excited about this month is replicating Richard Van Durek's complex electric field systems, because he's got two great alternatives that he talks about. Last APEC meeting, he, he blew my mind and probably many of many other minds uh, because he presented the mathematics and the necessary systems to talk about what happens to electric charges in different frames of reference and, and how you can derive a non-zero force from a solid body where you have electric charges flowing in different frames of reference or electric currents flowing in different frames of reference. So we're going to go ahead and replicate one of uh, Ben Durek's older systems. He has a rotary disk system that uses two physical disks. One moves, one doesn't. One is called the dot product disk. And the dot product disk here is made of very small particles, usually microspheres of some conductive material suspended in epoxy or uh, situated in such a way that when these tiny little microspheres are charged up and you, you feed them with an electric potential, that when there's a very small change due to a relativistic field being applied to them, the change in their potential does not have the ability to jump over and conduct current. So basically the charge stays on these microspheres, it doesn't leave them. And uh, as a result, they're able to experience a non-zero force. So our dot product disk, we have some new epoxy. Where is our epoxy? Uh, right there in the epoxy box. Right. I'm going to pull that down. Uh, get the Especially it. because Richard is, uh, you know, in the audience today. Uh, just pull the whole box down. I think I'm going to open this up and, and uh, pull out the data sheet here. Epoxy cast 670. So uh, this is an incredibly thin. No, that's not the, uh, that's not the stuff. Here the 690. Oh, the 690. That, yeah, that's the new stuff we're going to work with. So the 690 may buy smooth on. We're going to try to use this as an epoxy. It's it's incredibly thin. Um, trying to see where our centipoise rating is on our sheet. Either way, basically, it's a oh, mixed with phosphate. Here, yeah, here we go. 280 uh, centipoise. So it's it's a very, very thin epoxy. And I think that's going to really help us reach that saturation for our microspheres. We have three materials that we can use right now. We have um, a bismuth powder that's mostly spherical. We have a aluminum powder that should be satisfactory. We have a nickel silver powder. And uh, geez, which is that that I pulled out? The magnesium powder that I tested when I just did a pour test to, to sort of see if, you, uh, if you've ever done a uh, fine grinding on a powder and you try to pour out a large volume of it inside of a container, just tilt the container back and forth. If it's spherical, you'll notice that it just seems to flow almost like a liquid. It doesn't act like a powder or a solid, it doesn't bunch up. And uh, so we have some magnesium powder that uh, exhibits that property and we're gonna go with it's mostly spherical and try to inject a, a very large quantity of that to electrical saturation inside of the epoxy mixture so that we can charge up the microspheres, but uh, then allow them to maintain their charge as we rotate the cross product disc. And so we'll get to that. Well, what about the bismuth uh, powder? The bismuth powder is another possibility. And you know, the great thing is we have multiple samples and plenty of epoxy. So we can make, we can make many different dot product discs 
that are going to allow us to try these different materials and uh, their various properties. Uh, we also have copper powder as well. Indeed we do. The copper powder is pretty rough. It, it seems like it's starting to oxidize if you take a look inside. So I think we might avoid that or we'll have to do something to it to treat it. Um, so the cross product is this, we just need a very smooth conductive surface so that electrons can freely flow around it. The thinner that surface is, the better it's going to it's going to react. We want to keep them constrained down to that one axis as the cross product disc is rotating. Now, uh, last time, Richard revealed a very important piece of information, which is you actually get better results if you rotate the dock product disc. Now, that I haven't mathematically comprehended as to why you may get better results if you rotate the cross uh, or the uh, dock product disc. But my thinking was that the dock product disc is going to also experience forces from electrostatic charges on the body of the enclosure. Uh, that it may not actually, that it wouldn't experience at all if it was stationary compared to the body of the enclosure. So perhaps that's one explanation. Uh, the cross product disc is just going to be a CD-ROM that we stuck a voltage multiplier on and blasted off all the metallic coating of it. So we had a nice piece of plastic to work with. And then we laminated that CD-ROM with a piece of uh, thin film mylar using some adhesive and uh, pressed it down with some pressure to get a nice even surface. So we'll be spinning that up to 25,000 RPMs and we have just a, uh, another CD-ROM which all the printing was removed from. So we have that metallic coating, which is just a few ohms across the entire surface. That's another good solution for a cross product is where electrons can travel around it and um, you don't get the equal and opposite charges because the electrons are free to move across the surface of the disc. We also have those really cool um, hobby electric motors that, that are capable of like one horsepower. Those things are tiny. Yeah, those are going to give us quite a bit of torque, especially if, according to uh, Richard's paper, what happens is as you generate a linear motion from this system, you end up uh, with a resultant torque on the motor that causes it to slow down or uh, it, it loads the motor. So those nice strong motors at high RPM will be able to provide plenty of torque, not to say that we'll probably ever even come close to loading a motor because the speeds that we're talking about and the voltage differentials between the dot product and the cross product is are not realistically strong enough to cause us any significant power draw. It would it'd be wonderful if we could get materials that would allow us to do something like that, you know, where we could take a one horsepower motor and convert it straight to linear momentum and use all that energy. But I think we're, uh, we're a long ways away from that yet. Now, right now we just want to test it out, make sure that we understand properly what was presented, what, what Richard's theory implies and how to actually implement it. And then we want to try our best to try to do a, proper Eugene Pakhanov discharge, making sure that our experiment and the observations we make match the observations in the paper. And thanks to uh, the papers that Tim sent over, we have lots of information from POR, which is effectively on the same thing, which we now can use to derive what's going on with Pakhanov. Right. Uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the rectifier tubes. Uh, we have a couple yeah, of different options that is on a those. Good point. Some of them are still on their way. They're coming from uh, from Russia, I think, uh, the four hundred kV ones. Uh, we have a couple tubes up there. What what kind of tubes do you think we need for yeah, this? So what we ended up bordering is uh, we took a look on eBay and tried to find some reasonably high voltage tubes because uh, when when Ben Dirk uh, produced his patent and his patent, he talks about using you know several kilovolts, and we wanted to try to really push the boundaries of what the dielectrics could take. So we're, we're gonna try to go into the double digit kilovolts. And um, in order to do that, we needed some double digit rectifiers that could handle that voltage. So we ordered some from Russia, they're coming in and those are gonna allow us to isolate our electrical power supply or our power source from the physical device itself. So that electrons can't backflow. And if there's an imbalance due to the changes in the electric fields from the complex electric field interaction, that we're not gonna have electrons flowing into or out of ground or the power supply can try to neutralize out those changes in potential. Uh, so we're going to use rectifier tubes. We're going to power them off 18650 batteries or uh, other LiPo, small LiPo batteries so that we can completely isolate that system and uh, properly test what Bender has presented. Right. Also the oscilloscopes and uh, any test equipment that we plan on attaching to this experiment is also going to be floated using a UPS system. Uh, completely separate it from ground because I know that's very important. It was that big uh, eureka to realize that most of the reasons why we were having problems and erratic results had everything to do with the fact that we always had some kind of leakage or connection to an earth ground and that caused us major issues because an earth ground effectively an electrical, uh, an electrical connection between two points in any system ties those two 
systems together into the same frame of reference. And it's, it's wild to think that you can connect different frames of reference with a piece of wire, but that's, that's effectively what you're doing. So you have to keep them isolated. And to finally have learned about that and realized why we've seen some effects anomalously in very fast systems where the resistance of our electrical connections was actually not sufficient to totally separate out the frames of reference. That's why we've seen the effects. It was a big eureka to realize why. And uh, again, huge thank you to Richard for uh, presenting that so we finally understand. Okay, okay um, yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I've been listening here and I probably had a couple comments on what you had to say on this. Um, yeah, please. You, know, you had a question on the, rotating the dot product disk? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so what you want to do is, you know, one of the things the dot product is generating is a scalar potential. So uh, when you rotate it, you have you you're effectively taking the charge and um, accelerating it 90 degrees to its relative motion. Well, that causes the scalar potential to, to basically decouple from um, the potential. So it'll build up around the individual particles as um, say you rotate them. So that's the reason why you really want to to rotate the dot product disk too, because you're going to end up starting to build up the scalar potential, and then that actually, you know, the experiments we've done recently seems to show that it has that has a much greater effect than um, the cross product disk. So if you can, that would be a desirable thing is to get your dot product disk all balanced out, and if you can rotate that in the opposite direction as the cross product disk, I think you'll have a better effect. But yeah, it sounds like you're doing everything correctly, you know, just make sure you don't get any past the ground. And I think you should start seeing some uh, good results. And of course, yeah. you'll let me know when you start putting it together, right? Absolutely, Richard. I mean, you're, you're the reason why we're doing this particular experiment and what you presented was, as we said, a huge Eureka. It, it just is a, it's a total difference in understanding why some things happen the way they do, because we've seen strange effects for a long, long time. I've been doing this for now, going on almost 22 years. And I've seen a lot of really, really weird things happen, especially around very high currents with capacitor discharges, uh, around very high impulse voltages. And I, I've noticed a trend with these various things that I've seen with objects moving on their own or electronics being triggered by an EM pulse that should have never existed from the amount of power that we had, but it seemed to go a really, really long distance. Uh, it finally makes a lot of sense as to why you could be generating scalar potentials and, and how they can transfer. Because the great thing about a scalar potential, right, is that you can't really block it. It's a, uh, it's a point or it's a, uh, it's a charge that's going to expand out and that charge field is going to have an effect on all other objects. You can't really block a change in local electric potential from one uh, potential to another. It's going to penetrate. And that gives us the unique ability to change the field geometries of that generated uh, signal source and screw around with scalar potentials in a way that I don't think we've ever even realized we should be looking into. Yeah, yeah, and that seems to be the key here is those scalar potentials, once you're able yeah, to- Yeah, read the live chats. They'll, they'll persist there for a while too. Yeah, Jeremy, go ahead if you uh, have uh, live chat questions. I can't hear you. Jeremy, uh, go ahead if you have live chat questions. Your sound just went completely dead. I can't hear anything. Oh, did it turn it's, off? Uh, no, it says it's on. Yeah, I, I can still I'll hear you guys fine. I'll just stay close to Mark's mic, I guess. That's better. I just came back. So uh, live chat questions, Jeremy? Uh, over here, oh. we have our, um, our power supply racks. just want to show you this real quick. Um, this is for the uh, Alzafon experiment. This is a 30-volt, 30, 40-amp. 30 or a 40 volt, 30 amp uh, power supply. It's one of the really old kinds, super heavy, had to ship freight. Um, that's to supply the super uh, stable laminar magnetic field for the uh, electromagnet. Uh, up on top over here, we have a Maxwell 45 kV. This came out of Sandia Labs uh, used equipment. Uh, it's 45 kV, eight thousand watts and i managed to get the matching capacitors also 45 kv capacitors uh here locally so that is for the uh the lower voltage version of the um impulse experiment with uh pod clown for the super connectors um in order to read everything we got this out of uh, singapore it is uh 16 gigacycles per second scope um 
the only way we could afford a scope this fast is by getting a super old one that still works. And as you can see over here, we actually had to buy these. Um, I don't know if you guys can still remember these things. These are coming out of museums, floppy disks and a floppy drive in order to read the data. But uh, the scope still works and it probably costs as much as a small house when it uh, first came out. Over here we have, th this rack is really the super high voltage rack. Uh, there's a scope attached to it as well, which we had to shield from our last ex uh, experiment. This was for testing the capacitors. But uh, basically this rack has a gamma 125 kV 5 milliamp power supply. And um, below that is a 10,000 to one voltage divider. And that's hooked up to that oscilloscope. So we're able to see um, high voltage potentials uh, on, on a standard oscilloscope. We could also hook that up to our 16 gigacycle per second oscilloscope to measure the impulse uh, velocity rates, uh, you know, for, for any of these high voltage, high current um, experiments. And that's, that's most of our equipment right now. We have also in this corner, this is something that uh, Jeremy brought in. This is a 5 kV half amp power supply that's going to be used for the Klystron. Uh, Jeremy actually found that on Craigslist from a lab that was going out of business. And this is something that we couldn't find anywhere else. So it was, it was amazing that he was able to bring that down to the lab for us. And uh, we're currently really working on that. I think that we're going to have to bypass one of the safety uh, relays in order to just- Yeah, we're turn. going to bypass the- I just want to comment on how heavy that thing is. Yes, so. Oh, yes. How did you get that into the car on your own? <laughs> that thing is very heavy. I, I think I actually, I had help. I had to get help. I did. I could not have moved it by myself. No, uh, I, I did have to have a second person help me move it and, uh, and transport it. It's got a huge plate transformer in the bottom. That's a beast. You can see the, uh, the front dials. Look at the size of that dial. That's my hand. Yeah, that's some like 1940s old school equipment. That thing's diesel. That thing's built. You don't find equipment like that anymore. Yeah, so uh, I think the, this is the interlock. There's the problem with the uh, that transformer is blown out. It's a 12 volt transformer, so the interlocks are not working. So we could either we could either uh, replace the transformer, or we could just override the interlock. It's something that we're yeah. uh, we're considering. At its core, all all that thing really is effectively is a voltage divider for some meters and current, a variac, and a huge plate transformer that has multiple wiring configurations. And uh, all we have to do is give that very act power to feed the play transformer. The rectifiers are already in place and everything else should pretty much work straightforward. There is no reason why we need an interlock in that system if we're going to install it in the cabinet and bring out external cables anyways, we're gonna be setting it up in our lab and we have sufficient signage to indicate the dangers of the system. Uh, and something else that was really cool that he got from that same lab and uh, they couldn't explain it to Jeremy why they had it was a whole bunch of waveguides that were tuned to a very specific frequency of 6.21819 gigahertz. And they there's a ton of tu tuning that went into all these waveguides. There are several pieces of waveguide all tuned to a specific frequency. And that, that will work wonders for our experiment because if we can lock the, uh, the frequency in at a certain point, we can just use this uh, power supply over here um, to change the, the, uh, the flux in the uh, magnetic field and use that as our variable to finally find the uh, low more precession uh, frequency by changing the magnetic field strength. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty much the summary of what we already have going on. Uh, we are planning on a few other projects that we haven't really written up yet. These are the focus points right now. We don't want to get our hands in too many baskets. We want to focus on the projects at hand, which is Pakhanov and Richard Benderick. So if we can, we, if we can get far enough along on either of those that uh, we can make progress, then we'll move on to a few other projects, perhaps this month or the, uh, the following months. But that's the update from the Falcon Space Lab. That's where we're at right now. We're testing everything that we can, and we're focusing on the things that we think that we have at our current skill level and uh, our reception with the communities, things we can actually do and test properly. Because we're, we're not just trying to put together things that look kind of sort of similar to what the scientists did. We want to replicate as accurately, as faithfully as possible.
Exactly. Exactly. That's that's the most important point is to be able to actually replicate them in the lab. And I'm also excited about the Alzheimer's thing. I've been working on it for a while, but we need to figure out the waveguides. Until we figure out the waveguides, it's all it's all just a waste. You know? Yeah. The real trouble we're having with waveguide issues right now is that we can beam out that signal at whatever frequency we choose from our frequency sources, but that signal is basically hitting the sample and then flying past it and being lost in attenuation to the outside environment. So what we need is a resonant chamber that we can tune for the frequency ranges that we're using, which is the 8.8 .8 to 9.5 gigahertz range. And uh, then we need to design something else, perhaps more powerful for our Kleistron's range. So that way we can get a nice Q factor. We can get many, many times more power into the sample so that the sample itself absorbs that microwave energy instead of it just being lost in the environment or causing us SWR issues down the line. Yeah, and just reading SWR on a, um, on a microwave waveguide, I mean, there is no microwave waveguide uh, SWR meters out there. Uh, it's literally something you have to build yourself. And uh, we, we, we're talking to all the professionals in the field. It seems like it's a, it's a real specialty. There's very few people who understand this stuff. To the sort of an industry made. secret. Hey? It's an industry secret. Yeah. Like so, how do you design a proper waveguide with an incredibly high Q to get energy into a sample? How do you measure the Q in the first place? And how do you measure the reflected energy? These are all issues that we're going to have to work on. Not stuff that you can easily Google because uh, I've, there, I've spent many, many hours on there trying to find this stuff out. But unfortunately, it seems like it's just uh, it's, it's a bit difficult. Maybe it's because we're just ignorant of the right terms to use. We, we may not be looking up at you know the right information or we don't we even may know, not know the what question we're looking to ask. For. Right, exactly. We don't know what we don't know. So... This is definitely where we're asking for help to try to figure this problem out so we can test uh, Alzevon properly and get energy into the sample to see if we get good dynamic nuclear orientation and we get good coupling from our microwave energy into our sample. Uh, in terms of capabilities, we also have a 3D printer over here that we can print in a resin that we can then cast in any different metal. We have furnaces and we have casting materials. So if you want, if you want to cast something in silver, nickel, or uh, bismuth, we, have, we purchased a whole bunch of bismuth, it has a high spin ratio, it's a pretty interesting metal. We thought it might be interesting to try something with bismuth. Um, now, also you have the, uh, the, the bilayer uh, setup that was found as a supposed rec relic of a uh, flying saucer. And if, uh, you know, if, if there is something to bismuth uh, mixing with other metals in a bilayer that we can put into the uh, Alcephon experiment, that's something I really wanna try. Um, so any, any help from the community, anyone who, who knows anything about these experiments or knows somebody who knows how to work with uh, microwave waveguides and uh, tune them properly, that, that would be very beneficial to what we're doing over here. And uh, like I said before, we, we do have you know, some limited funding from, a, uh, from an anonymous donor. And so far they've given us around $30,000 and uh, this is what we've been able to put together with that. But we have more equipment coming in the mail. We also have a... Um, uh, a guest house available and uh, he's offered like if there's any scientists who have uh, re relevant information to the experiments that we're doing he's glad to uh, fund them to fly down here you know all expenses paid and uh, we can work on these experiments in this anti-gravity lab right here live and all of these videos all of these experiments by the way are going to be published live on YouTube, uh, Jeremy Reese and uh, Travis have worked out a system with multiple cameras. Uh, you can see our first demo of that where we, we kind of made a, a makeshift experiment just to try it all out. And uh, that, was, that was really amazing uh, how we were able to get all the cameras together and run an experiment live on YouTube. Okay. What happened? All right. I just want to remind everyone to smash that like button who's watching this live and uh, share this video with anyone you think who might be interested. Um, again, we're going to be making like short clips of, uh, you know, highlights and, and of key points and things. And uh, again, we, we invite anyone from the audience who um, has information they'd like to present and join this community, uh, anything that could contribute to the uh, body of knowledge um, or the list of, uh, or the experiments in the lab, anyone who has equipment or anything else like that, that their time or lab time that they can offer to run certain experiments, or if they have, uh, you know, they can help us run these experiments. Basically like the goal is to bring more and more 
scientists on who know know stuff about this share the information in an open atmosphere and kind of accelerate the process of 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 um, R and D for the, and disclosure uh, really of, of the information because it's uh so people think there's a lot of people talking about disclosure right now but they I don't think they're really willing to learn the real information um, and, and put the time in to, to really wrap their head around this kind of this kind of knowledge that's going to take to to build a uh, the first you know the first craft that gets us off this planet. Um, that's really, you know, the goal here. I know it seems like a, you know, a quite, quite a, quite a achievement for some of the people um, out there. Maybe thinking like this might be, this might be five, ten years, twenty years. This might take our lifetime. These guys have been working on it for quite, a, quite a long time already, and um, that's awesome that they're here to share all of their knowledge and experience with us. Um, there's no better teacher than failure, um, I say, and. Um, the more that we can demonstrate all these other experiments of the past in, in, in a lab setting with a, you know, a group of people that are really real skeptics that, you know, people that have a track record that people can trust. If we can vet these out in our own lab publicly, um, one at a time, it will save so many people so many wasted time or, or, or years of wasted time and, and their own wasted research and, and funds and everything. Cause there's so many videos on the internet showing those kinds of things. And, and if we can, we can show them and, and really vet out, vet them out and say like, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. You know, that's going to help save a ton of people's time. And if anyone out there has already done these experiments and, and knows, you know, how to set them up or has them already, you know, set up somewhere, they can go and show us, you know, okay, we've tried this, this didn't work, this didn't work. That's really where we need to go through because, um, and, and do is prove to people that no, they're, they're, they're the, you know, it, at the same time, it's not, not, it's going to vet out the whole um, people like Stephen Greer who claim that there's a secret space program that figured this all out back in the fifties. And, and, and if that was the case, I don't, I don't know what the heck you guys were doing working for DARPA on all this stuff for the past 50 years, if they already figured it out in, in 54, like um, Stephen Greer wants to tell everybody. Uh, and uh, <laughs> um, again, if they did, we're going to figure it out. We're going to find it. Um, but if not, and this is really is the cutting edge in, in humanity's evolution um, to the stars, then uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to hopefully put the laboratory and the team and the scientists together to, to bring disclosure on, on that level. Um, and hopefully the scientific community is open, open to that and, uh, you know, and open to contributing with us, you know, not just, you know, the naysayer, that there's naysayers that just want to fight everything and, and say, oh, you're not going through the conventional channels and stuff like this guy was saying in the, in the live chat. Um, you know, we, you should be doing peer review. Peer review will come. Like when we get something that is actually works and is worth, you know, writing a paper on, we're going to, I want to definitely write papers uh, with, with you guys. And we, we have a team of people ready to do that when our lab does have success. Um, I want to write papers and publish it in the peer review and get it out there. But I, I, I just, we, we also have a, a kind of a fear and a skepticism of that whole process that, you know, that whole system has been used to suppress information like this in the past. So we want to do it publicly first, demonstrate it and show people how to do it and, and whatever works, show people all the stuff that doesn't work. And then when we get it, we, should, we know how it works. We want to like have led up to it and, and people that, who have followed it to really have the knowledge and, and the background to understand the science behind it when we, when, when we do have that success uh, in the future. And I, I really have confidence that we will with this team and, and the amount of people that are coming out of the community to, to, and, and bringing us um, support and, and hope. Um, and, uh, can you guys uh, hear me all right? Wonderful, yes. And a little you, quiet. you know, Wayne has his hand up also. I should mention that. Yeah, Wayne, go ahead. Yeah. Hey. Um, yeah. I just wanted to do um, to share a couple of things, little things that I've been working on uh, and will be working on in the near future. Um, and it relates a lot to what Todd was sharing about the NMR and um, what you guys are working on and have worked on with Elzafon and all that. So um, I, I've been thinking about um, how to maybe work this thing in lower frequencies. Uh, so just using. Um, the, the, I made this last night. So this is going to be, there's going to be two Helmholtz coils oriented perpendicular to each other. So the one will produce kind of a weak magnetic field. I'm, I'm aiming for about 30 Gauss. 
And um, then I'm going to have across from that perpendicular, I'm going to have RF. Well, it won't be RF, something around the 20 kilohertz. So I'm aiming for around the audio frequency range. And I'm going to put some, I have it, I kind of calculated it to work with uh, bismuth because uh, I, I have some powdered bismuth I'm working with. And so I just put the sample in there and uh, maybe suspend it. Um, so that's something interesting. Um, and then here I had uh, inside here between these two neomagnets is an epoxy um, casting with uh, bismuth powder in it. And so I was uh, and will be playing with that, putting some uh, AC magnetic fields in here um, and just putting it on a scale and seeing what happens with that. Here's an older Helmholtz, Helmholtz coil I made. And yeah, so uh, this here is a capacitor I made. It's got uh, bismuth powder in the middle with epoxy and uh, dielectric. And uh, I was going to test it with uh, different, like high, high frequency, high voltage um, currents. I'm thinking the, uh, that might excite some, some effects inside the, uh, the bismuth atoms. So yeah, I just wanted to give a little quick update. Um, I'll be posting all my stuff on my YouTube channel, Fail Forward Research. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thanks. Yeah, let me compliment you on the quality of your builds now. I mean, they're looking really, really good. You're spending a lot of time putting them together uh, as compared to the earlier experiments where we sort of crashed course our way to figuring this stuff out. It looks like you're, you're uh, trying to up your game and that's awesome to see. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have a lot to work with, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can. So yeah, I, there's a long, there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go. Yeah. But. Great job, Wayne. Yeah. Thanks guys. And look forward to uh, all of what you're working on there. That's going to be amazing. The uh, other thing that I wanted to point out for sure, especially amongst this community, is once we build this equipment, you know, we, we may not be the biggest experts in the industry on exactly how to use it, but we have the equipment. So when we have a one megavolt Marx generator or you know, ni a 960 kV Marx generator, and you have an experiment that you want tested on it or an apparatus that you want hooked up to it, I mean, that's something we'd be interested in testing out. So we just want to sort of extend that, that offer out there to people in this community where if you have devices that require weird uh, equipment or specialized equipment like the types that we're setting up here, we would be interested in, in collaborating with you and uh, using what we've already acquired to try and test out your ideas and theories. And we can file, follow them like a scientific procedure and do exactly what you recommend to do to make sure that we uh, test what you're looking for. Wonderful. Well, gentlemen, should we, do you think we should call it a day today? Only one way to find out if he'll answer, and uh, I'd say give him a call. Well, no, I mean, yeah. I think it's probably time time for us to wrap things up for today. So yeah, I I, I agree, and uh, I'm just uh, typing some stuff away and getting some links together. Um, we're going to put some links together for for this whole talk. This was an excellent uh, excellent discussion. I learned a lot from our guests. Thank you, thank you, Gary, uh, for being part of this, and thank you, Todd, and uh, mm -hmm. and. and Thank you as always, always Tim, for putting this together. And um, and uh, applause for Tim. <laughs> well, Gary, thank you again, very, very much. And Todd, you, you as well. You're you're hiding on my screen, but I think you're still here. Uh, yeah, there you are. I'm losing. There you go. Okay. Thanks to everyone who uh, con contributed. Um, any anyone wants to give a shout out real quick to the end for a link or, or anything that they want to give a shout out, they can go ahead and do that, and uh, then we'll go ahead and wrap this up for the day. Fail Forward Research. That's Wayne. I'll give a shout out to him, uh, and then also uh, you guys can check out uh, Join the Technicians. Although uh, Jeremiah is not really doing much with that channel anymore, um, and. Um, and then I'll give up, I'll post a link to uh, um, Clay's website for his disclosure project there. Um, yeah, much. and we'll get Gary's material up as well. So, and, and then I believe sure. Todd, uh, Todd yeah, definitely Gary's send me over links. I and... his link already too. Sorry. Wonderful. 
Okay. Well, thank so you again. I, <laughs> I just want to make a shout out to Tim Ventura who made this entire thing possible. Let's go. Well, thank you, sir. Okay. On that note, let me let me hit the, the stop button and we will wrap this one up. This will probably be our last event for 2020. And there we go.